Historically, our other early evidence of Homo erectus comes also from East Asia, in this case from a site known as Zhokoqian, a cave site from north of Beijing that was excavated in the 1930s. The site produced an abundant assemblage of fossil material, including several cranial specimens, a large sample of mandibular remains, a huge trove of fossils. Unfortunately, and one of the most interesting sort of mysteries within paleoanthropology, we no longer have any of those fossils today. This site was being excavated in the buildup and midst of World War II, and the fossils were packaged and sent off actually to escape the war, packaged onto a train, and were never seen again. The train itself may have been bombed, we're not sure, but the fossils themselves don't survive. Fortunately, the excavators were able to produce high quality casts of the material before this happened. These casts were replicated and actually sent to institutions across the world. So we still have some evidence of these fossils in the form of the casts that were made from them back in the 1930s. It would be wonderful if we had the originals, but their whereabouts is a subject of historical mystery. Now, looking at the site itself, actually, the cave site itself is part of basically a large hill complex that was essentially entirely excavated in the 1930s. So nothing of the cave remains today, except for a visitor site where you can see different layers within what was once the cave itself. And actually, you can see the size of the excavation. A human would be about yay big in this picture. So this is a huge excavation. Uh, and there's a considerable amount of tourist information that you can actually see at the site itself in China. Moving forward, Jokochen isn't the only Asian site for Homo erectus, of course. It's an important one, and interestingly, it's quite far north in China. But there are other sites in China, including key sites like Dali in central China, Heshen in southeast China, Narmada, the one hominid fossil specimen that we have from basically South Asia, in this case from uh, central India. And we'll talk about a site from actually the Levant called Zutia. And of course, we have the Dimunisi specimens, which sort of span the gap between Europe and Asia, dated to about 1.8 million years of age as well. Zhokochen has several key specimens that we can think of, some of them reconstruction, such as this specimen, the L3 reconstruction, coming from the L layer. This is the third cranial specimen from that area. And it's a very solid reconstruction in terms of the overall amount of morphology that it displays for us. You can see that there are projecting superorbital tori that are kind of moderately sized in terms of their overall robustness. They form clear two arches over each orbit, so they're not a continuous bar, but rather a series of arches. They're relatively continuously thick throughout. So they don't have dramatic thinning on one side or thickening towards the central region, for example, but instead are rather continuous in terms of the degree of thickness. If we look at the skull, we can see a little bit of a sagittal keel, much like we saw actually in those specimens from Southeast Asia. But the frontal itself is a little bit more separated from the supraorbital torus. We don't have the continuous movement from the supraorbital torus into this sloping forehead. There's a little bit more of a gap, or what we would call a supraorbital sulcus here on these specimens. Looking at them laterally, here we have again the L3 construction on the left and the L2 construction on the right. We can see again the supraorbital torus projecting. We can see that supraorbital sulcus here is situated just behind it. We can see a fairly globular cranial vault. It's a long cranial vault, much like we saw in the Southeast Asian remains, but a little more vertically tall, corresponding to perhaps a slightly larger cranial capacity for these specimens as well. Notice we still have a very strong angular torus this projection of bone on the lateral posterior side of the skull. We also have very flat anteriorly facing zygomatics or cheekbones, something that's characteristic of the specimens from East Asia. Looking at them from an anterior perspective, you can perhaps get some glimpse of the degree of sexual dimorphism, at least in the face of these specimens. If L3 is a male and L2 is a female, you can get some sense of the differences in overall facial morphology. Notice again the relatively weakly developed cheeks in these specimens. This uh, malar notch, this inward projection of this specimen is something we'll talk about actually next week when we talk about the beginning of modern features. Notice also there's some difference in the degree of supraorbital torus on these two specimens. In both specimens we have a nice double arch, but there's a little bit difference in terms of how that arch is shaped with a little bit more central projection in the L2 specimen. You can see that sagittal keel fairly clearly here in these two specimens in the anterior perspective. And overall, you can get a sense of the kind of morphology that we're seeing across these specimens. One of the things about the Zhoko Chen sample is it preserves a lot of variability. Again, it's another site where we have a lot of specimens preserved, and perhaps not surprisingly, the large number of specimens corresponds to a lot of variability, much as we saw in earlier hominid remains from Sturkfontein or Dimunisi. Here you can see the G1 and M1 mandibles viewed laterally. And you can see that G1 is considerably taller in terms of the overall corpus height than what we see in the M1 specimen. 
Looking to the right here, we have again the dentition of the G1 specimen and the dentition of the A2 specimen, another mandible, and you can also see considerable difference in the overall size of the teeth. Just compare the length of the molar tooth row here. So M1, M2, M3 between the G1 specimen, which is quite large, and the A2 specimen, which is quite small. So there's a lot of variability in terms of the dimensions and shape of these mandibles, as well as the size and shape of the teeth that they preserve. So there's a lot of variability at Jokochen, but that variability is not constrained to East Asia. There's a lot of similarity across these remains as well. One of the comparisons we can make is between some of the Jokochen materials and Zutia, a slightly later Middle Pleistocene site actually from the Levant, or from the Near East. Zokogen 12 is a partial frontal specimen preserving, again, a slightly projecting frontal bone, well-developed superorbital torus that extends down laterally here on the side of the skull. And we can see that there's strong similarities between this specimen and what we see in Zutia, where again we have a slightly projecting frontal boss on the frontal bone, a projecting superorbital torus that extends laterally, and that presumably would extend into some zygomatics or some cheeks that face very much anteriorly. So there's a lot of similarity between these remains. Here we can see them in frontal view, and you can see, again, Shokochen is on the left here, Zutia is on the right, and again we can see thick superorbital tori forming a nice double arch. We can see a little bit less of a sagittal keel on this specimen, as this specimen might be slightly later in time. But we can see the same morphology replicated on the Zutia specimen. A superorbital sulcus following behind it on both specimens, and an overall appearance that is very similar, suggestive of this Asian form of Homo erectus. So just as in Southeast Asia, in the East Asian material, and in the Asian Homo erectus in general, we see both variation within the sample, but also a lot of continuity in terms of the kind of features that we see in specimens spanning the time range that we have fossils from Asia, extending from more than a million years of age up until the material we'll start talking about next week coming later in time at the end of the Middle Pleistocene. So again, we have variation, but variation coupled with perhaps regional continuity similarity in appearance, the development of distinctive characteristics that we find throughout specimens from this area from these time periods.